There are many mysteries in the universe of Starfield waiting to be explored by us spacefarers. Perhaps one of the bigger mysteries is an extremely hostile alien species called Oxisio Machina, which can translate to killing machine. But the people, the settled systems, call them by another name, Terror Morphs. In this video, we'll be examining Terror Morph and the lore surrounding these galactic alpha predators. With that being said, there will be spoilers for a questline, and if you want to read more about Starfield, check out starfieldwiki.net, run by the team behind UESP, and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more Starfield content, lore, and guides. The first time we spacefarers encounter any information about the existence of the Terror Morphs is when we stumble upon the abandoned United Colonies research facility on Crete that is completely trashed with destroyed equipment. Remnants of life softly linger within the eerie miasma of death. As we investigate, we find that the facility seemed to focus on not just xenobiology, but xenowarfare. Xenowarfare is simply the continuation of humanity's terrifying capacity for creativity when it comes to killing each other. Much like how humans on Earth used dogs, horses, elephants, and other animals to wage war, the United Colonies focused on controlling alien creatures to fight their rival, the Freestar Collective. The research facility was still active towards the tail end of the devastating colony war two decades ago between the FC and UC, as one of the computer files marked dates goes back to the year 2310, and we are exploring Starfield in the year 2330. We also discover the body of a Dr. Hayden Wynn, the senior xenobiologist of the facility who recorded the following on August 15, 2310. Thanks to the UC Marines, we now have the second piece of the puzzle, a fully grown alpha predator. According to my research, a group of astrogeologists made first contact nearly a hundred years ago on some remote moon. The creature didn't appear to be indigenous and was alone. There is currently no record of how it got there, so it was sheer cosmic chance that the astrogeologists found it, or rather, it found them. Scientists were quick to categorize it Oxisio Machina, roughly, killing machine. The UC Marines tasked with taking it down chose a simpler name, Terror Morph. I read the official record once. Of the eight-person squad, only two of the grunts survived, and one of those two lost a leg. Such an exciting time to be in Xeno Warfare. It seems that the UC Xeno Warfare researchers were trying to modify the Terror Morph, Five days after the terror morph is transported to the researchers, Dr. Wynn states that, Today, we fit the terror morph with the NCI. If our experience when the grunts first dropped off the creature is any indication, our sedation window will be around 15 minutes. We'd better make them count. NCI in this context means Neural Control Interface, something we'd find would be effective with other alien specimens bred or modified for warfare, such as the Unit 99 Siren on the planet of Nera, which was commandeered by ecliptic mercenaries. Unfortunately for the scientists of the Crete facility, the Terror Morph would be uncontrollable even with a NCI installed and would go on a rampage that would kill presumably most, if not all, of those in the facility. It's loose. The Terror Morph is when, when we tried to sync with the neural control interface, it just completely flipped out. Broke through its containment chamber like it was made out of paper. It killed Michelson, Cobb, and Sumatri in all of one minute. I'm, I'm not even sure where it is now. It took off deeper into the facility. A, a security detail went in after it, but good friggin' luck! When I know it's safe, I'm going to make a run for the comm relay. Try to call in the cavalry. This is Hayden Wynn, lead xenobiologist. Wishing he had gone to dentist school like his parents wanted. We're dead. We're all dead. The comms relay has been trashed. The whole room is trashed. We can't call for help. I can hear the terror morph roaring somewhere. And more people screaming. <laughs> If we're brave enough, we can encounter the escaped terror morph nearby the facility, although we don't chance it at this time given we have not enough knowledge about how best to handle such a creature. When we eventually reach New Atlantis on the planet of Jemison, 
we can learn a little bit more about the terror morphs in the UC Orientation Hall for prospective Vanguard recruits. One of my slates said terror morphs can control people's minds. But that can't be true. In the midst of the colony war, a different kind of tragedy struck the UC city of Londinian. A newly constructed but critical supply center for the United Colonies war effort, Londinian found itself overrun by one of the galaxy's most mysterious predators, the Terramorph. A rare but pervasive threat to all human cell no worlds, Terramorphs shot over the city seemingly out of nowhere on something. a scale never before seen in recorded history. Valiant efforts by the UC military slowed the onslaught, but the creatures proved unstoppable. Ultimately, the decision was made to destroy the Londinian spaceport, sealing off the city, the outbreak, and its citizenry from the galaxy at large. The tragedy of Londinian is mourned by the UC to this day. The idea is terrifying. Creatures that seem to chase after humanity's footsteps as they spread throughout the known galaxy. Alien creatures that no one knows anything about that can just appear seemingly out of nowhere and not only overwhelm an entire city bristling with human life and technology, but also force a multi-planetary government's military to quarantine and bombard said city as the only viable option before the swarm can potentially spread to other areas not only on the planet, but also throughout the settled systems. Sometime later, we can enlist in the United Colonies Vanguard for a variety of reasons. Perhaps we want that juicy citizenship, or access to better ship parts, or better armaments, or we just need the credits. It doesn't matter, but we enlist anyway. And on our very first mission as a fresh UC Vanguard recruit, we are assigned to assist the settlers of Tau Ceti II by repairing their communications. After we land on Tau Ceti II, immediately we can sense that something is wrong. It's quiet. Too quiet. As we get closer to where there should be people, we see broken fences, blood, corpses, dead lights with only the sound of the rainfall to accompany the ghastly scenery around us. We've seen the work of spacers, the Crimson Fleet, and the Ecliptic, this doesn't seem like their M.O. In fact, it reminds us of a certain research facility. It turns out that this particular area was the site of Tau Gourmet, an ambitious project started by five settlers, Coat, Ian, Maria, Andre, and Lambert, with the sole intention of making fresh food cheap and available instead of giving into the Chunks Corporation. Welcome to Chunks. Please choose your chunks. And freeze dried foods. They wanted to raise the free range livestock and grow organic crops. Unfortunately for them, as we continue on in and witness more gruesome scenes, it seemed that they were the ones who were slaughtered and processed. We then run into Hadrian, the sole survivor of whatever happened on Tau Ceti II hold up on the second floor of the main facility. She then begins to explain what happened and that a terror morph appeared and killed everyone. We come up with a plan to reactivate the power grid and turn on the turrets to draw the terror morph into the turrets line of fire. However, plans rarely work out for us and we end up having to bravely fist fight the terror morph to death after it decides to go after Hadrian instead. In terms of its physical appearance, the Terramorph seems to be a carapace six-legged creature with pulsating spore-like boils on its back. Two large claws adorn the end of each limb, claws that can easily rip humans apart. A ravenous mouth with what seems to be multiple eyes adorns the front of what it would be its face, while a short bony tail protrudes from the back. Their resistance to damage of all kinds, bullets, blades, explosives, and punches make it quite a task for a squad of soldiers to handle, let alone one explorer and their companion. Their physical prowess is impressive, with their ability to climb and jump, catching many of their potential prey off guard. 
their ability to stagger you with just their roars and burrow into the ground and pop up elsewhere is quite unnerving. But perhaps most terrifying of all is their confirmed ability of mind control over other creatures as draws or pets or toys, whatever that means. We haven't truly seen this capability yet, and at this point in our journey, we're not sure how they exactly control other creatures, or if we humans are even subject to such a power. After we kill the Terramorph Haunting Tall City 2, Hadrian runs a preliminary sample analysis of the now-dead Predator, and something causes her huge concern as she begs you to find a former colleague of hers called Percival on Mars so that he can run more advanced tests to confirm her suspicions. She doesn't understand how terror morphs, which apparently takes usually anywhere between 50 to 70 years to appear after humans settle on a planet, can suddenly appear on Tau Ceti 2 when it hasn't been that long since humans arrived on the planet. The presence of this anomalous terramorph implies that the terramorph that attacked the Tau Gourmet facility grew much more rapidly or was transported from off-world. Neither a nice scenario to think about, as again, no one knows how terramorphs travel between planets. Is it like the bugs ejecting spores into space like in Starship Troopers? Are there terramorphs somehow manifesting out of thin air just because they want to hunt humans? Or perhaps, more disturbingly, could they be a creature that simply exists on every habitable planet outside of the soul system? Theories aside, things also aren't adding up here at this point in the back of our minds as far as Hadrian's presence goes. It seemed too coincidental that a scientist who knows quite a bit about terror morphs happened to be at the scene of a terror morph attack and that she also happens to know a former colleague who can help her with what is perhaps the most enigmatic alien known to humanity. Nevertheless, you accept Hadrian Sanon's request to not only find Percival, who is sheltering up in the former UC Marines Red Devils HQ, but to also enlist the help of your superior commander Tuala in potentially helping her access Terramorph research that seems to be locked away. Eventually, after fulfilling both of her requests, you discover from Tuala that she and her colleagues were involved in the Xeno Warfare Division under the United Colonies during the Colony War. Now it starts making sense as to how she has the knowledge. Percival also confirms Hadrian's suspicions of the Terramorph sample being the same as the Terramorph samples that can be found from the desolate location of Londinium, the city bombarded by their own government in an effort to isolate the Terramorph threat. No traces of ship transportation via chemical tracing could be found either, which gives us yet another dead end as to how a fully grown Terramorph got to Tau Ceti too. It's after these findings that Hadrian and Percival finally come clean to us about their past in Xeno warfare research and technology. But what worries us is not just terramorphs anymore, but the mere possibility of our new friend's findings that humanity may need to contend with a faster growth cycle of terramorphs and potentially prepare for a series of apocalyptic events spanning across the settled systems. It is at this point Hadrian requests a meeting with the cabinet, the top brass of the United Colonies government, one of the three factions alongside the Free Star Collective and House Varun needed for their approval to access the Forbidden Archives, a repository of information banned and hidden from the eye of the public and the eyes of all governments after the Colony War, as such information, including Xeno Warfare, was deemed too dangerous. Before the meeting, Hadrian Sanan confides in us that the meeting may not go well as she is a clone of Francois Sanan, the infamous former UC Admiral who commanded the entire fleet during the Colony War, the one responsible for the glassing of Londinium and the one who apparently opened fire on civilian ships during the Battle of Cheyenne. After the devastation wrought by the Colony War, the UC and the Freestar Collective came together to ratify a treaty that became known as the Armistice. Both sides 
sides agreed to a vast reduction in standing forces, and that Xeno weapons and mech warfare would be outlawed. All related research was sealed away, accessible only in cases of dire emergency. But the Collective had another demand, that the active commanders of the UC military stand trial for their actions. The United Colonies in the interest of peace and galactic security agreed. In 2311, three United Colonies senior officers were found guilty. Commander Henry Durant, General Indira Rastogi, and Fleet Admiral Francois Senon, known better as Ve Victus. All were sentenced to death for their actions, bringing the colony war to a close and returning peace to the galaxy at long last. Hadrian is worried that the sins of the father may be judged upon the daughter by the politicians of the cabinet, despite there being no actual familial ties between the two. The meeting, as expected, doesn't go very well, as the cabinet members are unconvinced despite being told by our party that all Terramorph research conducted by the Xeno Warfare Division would be useless as Terramorphs cannot be tamed nor controlled by humans. They refuse to listen to the fact that the only usage for such information during peacetime will be to destroy the Terramorphs or at least prevent them from spawning in mass. Just as the meeting is about to be adjourned, not in our favor, there is a Terramorph attack in New Atlantis at its spaceport. The city goes into lockdown as you head towards the spaceport through the NAT system, we encounter humans going berserk and attacking one another. The appropriate way to handle this situation is to stun those who are being mind controlled by the Terramorphs instead of outright killing them. Though maybe we're not so good at not killing in such stressful situations. Yeah, what the hell happened back there, Captain? There's no excuse for using lethal force here. Hadrian notes that not every human is affected the same way by the Terror Morph's mind control capabilities. Some lose control, some attack others with full consciousness, and others are simply not affected. We make our way to the spaceport, and we see that soldiers have also arrived and put up barricades to contain the Terror Morphs on the landing areas of the spaceport but they're being assailed by a rather red and discolored Terramorph. After helping put the first one down, we head in, backed by a squad of UC security forces to kill the other two Terramorphs. Evidence of damage is apparent in the spaceport, and curiously enough, we notice that at least one of the Terramorphs must have sprung up from underground due to a hole with debris found around it. After we kill the three Terramorphs, we now understand the gravity of the situation even more. Three terror morphs had caused a city-wide shutdown, as we think to ourselves. What would a dozen or a hundred terror morphs be capable of? We make our way back towards the cabinet, and they too are shaken by the abrupt terror morph attack, a timing which seemed a bit too coincidental yet again. We brush that nagging thought aside as the United Colonies grants us permission to access the archives. Now, we need to convince the other two factions, House Varun and the Freestar Collective. After solving some robot troubles and political blackmail here and there, we get the consent of the other two factions to access the archives, which is located in a heavily guarded vault level beneath New Atlantis that sees the presence of both the FC and UC soldiers. After we retrieve the relevant Xenomorph data from the archive and hand it to Hadrian, we are brisked away by Deputy Chief Diplomat McIntyre for a private naturalization ceremony as a UC citizen, but also to be entrusted with what is perhaps one of the darkest UC secrets. We are instructed to head down under the mass building to subsection 7, where we can potentially learn more about the terror morphs and how to handle them. We notice that security is even tighter than the archives to the point our companion needs to stay outside while we venture inward through a locked corridor. Inside, you meet with a man curiously imprisoned in what is essentially an underground house blocked off by a sturdy glass wall, Hannibal Lecter style. As we sit down to talk to this mysterious man through the intercom, 
we are shocked to learn that he is no one other than Francois Sanon, aka Ve Victus, Woe to the Vanquished, one of the three war criminals prosecuted by the UCNFC after the end of the Colony War and executed despite the claims of fervent patriotism and heroism during the war. Francois Sanon reveals that he is alive only because the last UC administration wanted to retain him as a secret advisor as one final act of rebellion against the Freestar Collective and to also procure his assistance hunting down other war criminals he was familiar with who escaped justice post-colony war. While we try to wrap our minds around the potential consequences of the secret leaking out into the settled systems, Francois further reveals that he was the one responsible helping us behind the scenes by gathering Hadrian's old research team and offers further assistance should we help him kill one of his former colleagues and war criminal on the run, Dr. Reginald Orlaise. We agree and manage to track down Dr. Orlaise, but... Before we can apprehend him, he commits suicide, and much to our frustration, we can't access his purged files to find out more of what he was up to while he was on the run for the past two decades, although it seems he was in contact with a mysterious benefactor. We return to Francois Sinan, who gives us the whereabouts on Kaiser, a Xeno Warfare robot assistant that's been stranded on the war-torn planet of Nera. We're told that Kaiser will be essential to the capture and preservation of more Terramorph samples that we need to further research. Fast forward to Nera, we find Kaiser being preyed upon by heat leeches, a common pest in these settled systems that often attach themselves to any heat source possible, usually starship engines, generators, lights, and sometimes even humans. After we free Kaiser and help him with his last mission on Nera of killing or capturing Xeno Warfare Unit 99, the only reason why he's been active on Nera for the past two decades, we finally regroup with Hadrian, Percival, and the others in the Red Devil's headquarters on Mars, where we're presented with two potential solutions for our Terramorph problem. The first is to develop a microbe in aerosol form that can target and kill Terramorphs. The second solution is to reintroduce and breed the Terramorph's natural predator, the Aceles, on human settled planets. The first is obviously faster, though there might be unseen repercussions, and the second is slower, with less unforeseeable problems. Before we decide, we need more data, and according to what Hadrian found from the Terramorph samples, the available data suggests that the Terramorphs may have originated from the planet of Ptolemon II, the homeworld of the city of Londinium, where the Terramorphs swarmed and devoured the city during the Colony War. Hadrian suggests this theory on the basis that the mostly docile Aceles, which is the only thing that hunts and eats Terramorphs, originally come from Ptolemy II, and as they went almost extinct, it could be that the sudden swarm of Terramorphs could be attributed to the decline of the Aceles population. It makes sense, and we decide to go to Londinian with the permission of the UC government. To exemplify how bad it must be down on Ptolemy II, UC patrol ships orbiting Ptolemy II warn us to not go down, as Ptolemy II is still infested with terramorphs. We grimly enter the atmosphere of Ptolemy II, however, as the local security and quarantine forces are expecting our arrival. Ptolemy II is a cold planet, and Londinian is not even a shadow of its former self, and yes, it is infested by terramorphs. Destroyed buildings, walls, and stores of a lifetime ago remain in the bleak cold. The only sound breaking the air on occasion is a UC firing range. We're assisted in our preparation by the UC forces. We gear up, take available supplies, and enter the dilapidated city of Londinian. Almost immediately, we're set upon by normally docile alien creatures that are obviously being mind-controlled by a nearby terramorph. After we kill the Thralls and their master, we are confronted by two uniquely colored terramorphs, 
a dark aqua colored terramorph and an albino terramorph that try to invade your mind as they attempt to gorge upon you. Frightened whispers, panicked yelling and shouting from their past victims during its feeding frenzy in Londinian almost overwhelm you as you slowly fight them off and emerge victorious. Those telepathic messages from the past haunt us. Do the terramorphs not only feed off of flesh, but also literally our terror? The choice of the terramorphs to use the sounds of desperate humans is something oddly specific here, and I do keep coming back to the mind control aspect of the terramorphs because without that power, they're just another space bear or physically powerful apex predator. One key thing I note about it is that Initially, it appears in Starfield, the indication you're hearing these voices, or at least being affected partly by mind control from the Terramorphs, is represented by a black and cyan-colored smoke effect. While it could be plausible that the Terramorphs' telepathic attacks are physical, such as spring pheromones, or a sort of gaseous cloud on you, the fact that you can hear soldiers fighting, women screaming, survivors desperately trying to get away from the Terramorphs you're fighting, seems to give more credence to the conclusion that Terramorphs do have psychic powers. I'm sure there will be some lore debate about this in the future, which I welcome. After the fight is over, Kaiser interestingly points out that we can use the sewer tunnels to get to the Londinian spaceport where we've detected something strange. Funnily enough, Kaiser itself doesn't know how it knows about the Londinian sewer towers, but we forge on ahead, and in the tunnels we come upon the Lazarus plants that's grown in the absence of humanity. Supposedly, according to Hadrian, a plant that's impossible to cultivate anywhere in the known galaxy except on Ptolemyan II. We notice that there are also heat leeches, and we kill the pests, but note that there doesn't seem to be a source of heat they can gravitate to apart from ourselves, which might be why they travel towards us in the first place. As we enter an observation room, we see that there are some Lazarus plants blossoming behind a glass display, and we gaze in horror as a heat leech, touched by the pollen of the Lazarus plants, undergoes a grotesque and rapid transformation into a full-grown terror morph. It all makes sense now. Heat leeches are terramorphs, the most common space pest that stows away in starship engines within the vacuum of space and is resilient to so many different kinds of environments on so many different planets are simply baby terramorphs. Ptolemyan II was most likely when the first heat leeches stowed away on human ships and from there they spread out and reproduced all over the settled systems, or at least wherever humans went. It makes us shudder to think of how many thousands or millions of heat leeches have hitched a ride on humanity's ships since we left our or returned to our solar system. It explains why terramorphs inexplicably pop up out of nowhere wherever humanity goes and why they can burrow so easily as heat leeches seem to burrow as well. In retrospect, even some aspects of their appearance are uncannily the same. Heat leeches being terramorphs also explains the long cicada-like growth cycle that terramorphs must hypothetically undergo in order to eventually hunt down humans. Something so small transforming into something so big, fearsome, and above all, intelligent takes time. Yet all of these discoveries still don't answer one remaining question. If the Lazarus plant that can expedite the growth of a terramorph can only grow on Ptolemyan II, then how did the Tau Ceti II terramorph develop so quickly? There's two possibilities, that somehow the Lazarus plant is growing somewhere on Tau Ceti II, or 
someone has figured out how to bioengineer the Lazarus plant to where they can effectively carry it off of Talib Man 2. The latter has huge implications as whoever ha who has figured out such a thing would have the galaxy's most dangerous biological weapon known to humanity, and the weaponization of terramorphs considering that they are essentially dormant time bombs on all human colonies would be absolutely devastating and could spell the potential extinction of humanity. Shaken and overwhelmed by this possibility, we slowly make our way up to the former command center in the spaceport where we are able to recover an audio recording of some of the last days of Londinian. In the recording, Francois Sanon is talking to his subordinate, Colonel Akulov, about the Lazarus plants the soldiers found in the subterranean level of Londinian. It's heavily implied that Francois knew that the heat leeches were terramorphs and that the Lazarus plants could expedite their growth process. In one sentence, Francois not only commands the colonel and the garrison soldiers to remain in a defensive position around the spaceport, but he also condemns them to death as he fully knows he's about to order orbital bombardment upon not just the city, but the soldiers under his command who unknowingly stumbled upon the secret of the Terramorphs. We can only guess as to why the famed Admiral ordered the bombing at this point because even that is now under question. According to the United Colonies, the destruction of Londinian was necessary to quarantine it from the rest of the settled systems. But the genius tactician Ve Victus knew that Terramorphs needed human ships to spread, why would they destroy the entire city and strain the survivors? Terramorphs also aren't some sort of fungal zombies that can spread infection, and it seems so far that Terramorphs' mind control effects on humans seem somewhat limited compared to the effects they have on less intelligent alien creatures. Or can Terramorphs command humans to pilot ships for them? No, we conclude that there had to have been another reason why Francois Sanon was willing to eradicate Londinian, and if he was the only other individual outside of our party to have known about the Lazarus plan, then he very well could have been the one who somehow orchestrated the recent Tau City 2 and new Atlantis Terramorph outbreaks. Before we can fully process these revelations, we must finish our work in Londinian, and by the end of our trek into the spaceport, we encounter an incredibly large specimen dubbed the Terramorph Anomaly. It's not certain why it's so large or anomalous, perhaps it's one of the older Terramorphs that's proud Talon Man 2, or perhaps the size and appearance is indicative of the Terramorph's ability to adapt to its surrounding environment. It's a tough battle as we contend with the Trap Moth Draws as we fight the formidable Terramorph at the same time. But eventually, we kill it and take the cell and tissue samples from the creature so that we can finally finalize our research and development of Terramorph contingencies. We confront Francois Sanon one final time in subsection 7 under the heart of New Atlantis with accusations and evidence. Francois smugly chuckles and confesses that we are right, that indeed he did know for the past two decades that heat leeches were terramorphs and he told nobody about it, that indeed he knew about the properties of the Lazarus plant. He gives a few reasons as well as to why he ordered the destruction of Londinian. He was afraid that the Freestar Collective spies could discover what he knew, 
and he was afraid those under his command would also eventually talk about the things they saw. Francois goes on to imply that Londinian probably was not truly lost to the terror wars, but the destruction of the settlement, while costly, was worth the terrible cost of preserving the safety of the United Colonies, and in the end, himself, as he could use this information to his advantage as a prisoner when bargaining with the UC administrations. He also goes on to explain he was the mysterious benefactor that was working with Dr. Reginald Orlais, who did in fact successfully synthesize the Lazarus Plains pollen. In the two decades since his imprisonment, Francois patiently and slowly moved behind the scenes to accomplish his goals. Francois claims he did all this not just for himself or out of patriotic love for the United Colonies, but also for Hadrian, his clone daughter, to be recognized as a hero, which explained the rather coincidental timing of the Terramorph attack on Tau Ceti II. It was even Francois who put the knowledge of the Londinian sewer system into Kaiser's programming for Hadrian to discover, so she could arrive at the correct conclusion about heat leeches and terramorphs. Francois offers us a choice at this point. We keep his secret, so all living parties involved can reap the benefits while the dead, such as Dr. Orlais, gets the blame, or we tell the UC cabinet about his involvement, which may jeopardize their efforts in hunting down war criminals from the colony war if they decide to execute or fully imprison him. It's a hard choice to make and something many of us I'm sure will differ on. However, in our universe, we decide that the truth must come out about Francois Sanon's involvement in the Terramorph attacks. There's no telling how he would betray us in the future or how many more innocent lives would be extinguished for the sake of his twisted view of advancing the United Colonies' political and military influence, especially if he will be elevated to a position of higher power or freedom. We also decide to convince the UC cabinet to share the knowledge of not just heat leeches being terramorphs with the other factions, but also coordinate the destruction of the Lazarus plant to prevent it from being used as a weapon. Perhaps a more important choice that was presented to us would be the handling of the terramorphs themselves. Do we go with a microbial aerosol with immediate effects, or do we go with the reintroduction of the natural predator, the Aceles? Fearing that the terramorphs or heat leeches would potentially develop a mutation or resilience to the aerosol, we choose to reintroduce the Aceles, a slower process but something at least confined within the boundaries of non-man-made nature with less unforeseeable consequences. Furthermore, a natural predator may be the better choice as heat leeches can burrow and it would potentially be difficult for humans to always constantly scan the underground, especially when you take into account that full-grown terramorphs have been seen emerging from the underground. After seeing the colossal terramorph anomaly on Tallyman 2, we thought it best not give terramorphs another potential advantage nor chance to overwhelm humans again on either the biological or logistical level. The lore and biological details surrounding the Terramorph truly are fascinating. While we've unraveled some key mysteries together in our journey about this alien species, such as where they come from and how they really move around the settled systems, I personally find the implications of their existence and the human element in the story in some ways more terrifying and frustrating. As far as the heat leeches and terramorphs go, I don't think the eradication of the entire species will be an easy nor collaborative task once we look outside of the faction scope. Heat leeches are incredibly resilient to various environments and their ability to survive space travel and ability to burrow will make things difficult with or without an aerosol. And of course, this isn't even taking into account existing terramorphs, which seem to have the properties and base abilities of a heat leech. In the Starfield Digital art book, the developers detail that the excrement of a heat leech 
can be used as a resource for drug production. Considering that there is an entire drug pleasure hub such as Neon and there are entities such as a trade authority and uh, Reliant Medical uh, and that smuggling, piracy and a whole bunch of illicit activities can hardly be policed in literal outer space, it's highly unlikely that Terramorse will go extinct ironically because of humanity. And as shown by the tragedy of the Crete Xeno Warfare Research Facility, humans even in the 24th century and probably beyond seem to love meddling with nature and what they probably shouldn't meddle with. While on the surface the lore and quest line about the Terramorphs is about the threat they pose to humanity, the decisions and actions of Francois Sanon and other individuals during or after the colony war makes you regard humans as a more dangerous species, perhaps even more dangerous to ourselves than the Terramorphs are to us. Say what you want about the Terramorphs, but so far, there doesn't seem to be any recorded encounters of Terramorphs turning on one another, whereas the humans of the 24th century, and in turn we, the players in our own reality in the 21st century, are more than willing to do so for perceived gains. The brief yet important detail about the Asiles seem to also be a not so subtle jab at how often we humans disregard not just each other, but the ecosystems we often come into contact with, which inevitably harm us in the end. If the Asiles had never been driven into extinction in this case, the Terramorphs that swarmed Londinian would never have existed, and Londinian citizens could still be alive. There are also definitely some parasitical parallels between humans and terramorphs versus the relationship between rats and fleas, which of course developed into the bubonic plague at one point, but it seems with the terramorphs' ability to mind control other creatures while having only one natural predator on one planet in the entire galaxy, the overall impact is a lot more devastating, and all because humans meddled with things on one planet. Which is crazy considering that the same humans that ran the Asilis to extinction commemorate the, the Asilis with a statue, which I think has a lot of layers of messages behind that alone. I really, really enjoyed the Terramorphs and the lore we uncovered, and I think along the way, there's a lot more stories and themes we could talk about in a lot more videos, just off of this questline and the lore. So if you enjoyed this Starfield lore video, you want to see more of it, definitely subscribe to the channel and let me know what you think about the Terramorphs and what we uncovered in this video, or even better, what you want me to cover in the future. I'm hoping we'll one day return to the topic of Terramorphs in a future video, because they are definitely a fascinating creature, both literally and figuratively, but for now, let's go explore some other things in Starfield. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you out in the Starfield.